Hey there guys, gals, and non-binary pals. This is chef and author Kenji Lopez-Alt, and I'm here to answer your cooking questions on Twitter. This is Cooking Support. At Dollars More asks, what's the difference of cooking Chinese food with a wok than your regular frying or saucepan? All right, so the main difference between a frying pan, a Western style frying pan like this, and a wok, is uh, obviously the shape. So the way a wok heats up, you're gonna get a really hot zone in the center down here where it's closest to the flame and then it's going to get progressively cooler. A Western style frying pan on the other hand, all of this is meant to be sort of relatively evenly heated so you don't get those cooking zones. In a Western skillet, you're going to be shaking around and when you shake around like this, when you're sauteing something, the food naturally forms a sort of even layer and it cooks evenly. And that's really good for sort of sweating vegetables, the things that you might do at the beginning of a soup or a sauce or a stock, something like that. Whereas in a wok, when you shake it, they obviously all fall down to the bottom, so you don't get an even layer. However, in a wok, the, sh the shape allows you to really efficiently get food moving through the air, and that's the process you're gonna be doing when you're stir frying the majority of the time. So that's the difference between a wok and a Western skillet. At True Visuals asks, what's with asparagus and stinky pea? Asparagus contains these sulfur compounds that some people can digest and some people cannot. It's estimated that about 20 to 50% of people cannot digest these sulfur compounds. And for those of us, which includes me, if you eat asparagus about 15 minutes later, go pee and your pee is going to smell like these sulfur compounds. So there's a very distinct asparagus pee smell. Now, this gets confounded by the fact that there are also some people who can smell these compounds and some people who can't. Tane McLean says, how do you ruin a good burger? So personally, there's a few things I like to avoid when I'm making a burger. I don't like adding things inside the burger, so I don't like adding egg crumbs or eggs or spices or seasonings. I feel when you do that, it turns it more into a sort of meatloaf, what I associate with a meatloaf texture and flavor. So I like just pure ground beef. I do like to have it plenty fatty. So, you know, something around 25 to 30% fat in my burger, that's what I want. I want it nice and salty. Whether it's gonna be thick or thin, I want it to have a nice deeply browned crust. There are some people who like steamed burgers, it's a thing, but please don't steam my burger. <laughs> At Haitian Soul asks, does anybody know how to butcher a whole chicken? Uh, me, I know how to butcher a chicken. Um, so I'll show you right here. So why would you want to butcher a whole chicken? It'll save you money. It's cheaper to buy a whole chicken than to buy the individual parts. It also gives you lots of tasty things like the backbones and the carcass. You'll use those to make stocks that are better than what you could buy in a box. We are gonna first take off the legs. There's this little flap of skin that stretches out. All you gotta do is kind of nick that with a sharp knife, just like that, and do the same thing on the other side. Just give it a little nick. Get your thumbs in there and twist them until the joints pop out. Now you hold it by one leg with the chicken kind of hanging down. And then what you want to do is you want to get your knife in here. And right here is a little nugget of meat called the oyster. You want that to come with you. You don't want it to stay in the carcass because it's tasty. All right, so we're going to try as much as possible to get our knife down into there. And then we just go through the joint, which we just popped out. And then you have your leg. Same thing on the other side. Make sure we get the oyster. Look for the articulation, the place where the, the two joints meet, right there. Now you wanna get your knife right in that slot and just cut through. All of this should be pretty easy. If you feel yourself forcing it, then you're, you've hit the bone uh, and you wanna reset. I like to leave my chicken breasts with the, uh, the skin on and bone in, typically when I'm cooking them. So the way I do that is first I take this wing off, twist the chicken around until you've cut all the meat around that wing and your knife is in contact with the bone the whole way. So we see some bare bone here and flip it like that and it pops right off and you have this nice exposed bone which is gonna look really pretty when you cook it and then you can get the whole chicken wing with the, uh, the drumette and the flat attached, okay? And now for your chicken breast and you cut down into the ribs and this is the only place where you're gonna be cutting through bones. Um, the ribs are pretty easy to cut through though, all right? And you go all the way down, flip this inside out. The wishbone's gonna pop right out like that. There's your chicken back. You can chop that up to make stock with. Split the chicken right down the sternum and there you've got a bone in, skin on, chicken breast for cooking. And then if you do want to remove the chicken breast from the uh, carcass, what you're gonna do is run the tip of your knife basically along one side of the sternum. The meat should separate pretty easily. Run your thumb along the meat and pull it away from that connective tissue. And then just finish it off with your knife and there you've got your boneless chicken breast. And that is how you butcher a chicken.
At Joshna Maharaj asks, hey peeps, doing some research. How do you get really crispy skin on your roast chicken? To get really crispy chicken skin, there's a few steps you have to take. What I like to do is spatchcock it. So I cut out the backbone with a pair of scissors. You can ask the butcher to do it for you also. Then you can lay it out flat. So you get all this surface area exposure to the heat of the oven. Finally, the other thing I like to do is I season it with a mixture of kosher salt and baking powder. Mix it up in a bowl, sprinkle it all over your chicken. What happens is the baking powder will react with some of the juices that are coming out of the chicken skin and those juices are really rich in protein and they form these teeny tiny bubbles that as they dehydrate they add surface area and therefore extra crunch to your chicken skin. At Fio na 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 na. I didn't know that radiation is also one of the heat transfer methods for food. How the hell radiation cooks food? <laughs> All right, so there are three basic types of heat transfer, um, whether you're talking about food or anything. There is conduction, that's when I touch a hot metal pan and the heat is going directly from the metal surface. There is convection, which is when the heat is transferred through a medium such as flowing air or flowing water. And then there's radiation, when you don't need any kind of contact at all. The most common form of radiation you're probably gonna find in your cooking is when you're baking something in the oven. An oven cooks through a combination of convection in the air and infrared radiation directly from the oven walls. So whenever you're cooking, over coals or under a broiler, the type of heating that you're doing is radiation. It's direct heat energy coming from the heat source through the vacuum of space or through the air, as it were. At Worse Make asks, tell me, Hank, what constitutes a pinch of oregano, a smidge of basil, and what is salting to taste? Whose taste? What kind of taste? So if somebody says a pinch of oregano or a pinch of cumin, I would think that it's about this, about a sixteenth of a teaspoon or so. But if you love oregano, you love cumin, put more of it in. It doesn't really matter. The one case where it does matter is with salt, because salt can have a severe impact on the way foods cook, because uh, it chemically interacts with meats, it chemically uh, interacts with a bunch of different things. But with salt, typically what you're looking for is around a one to two percent ratio of salt to other stuff in each given bite. So if I have a soup, I'm I can weigh out the soup and I can add one percent of that weight in salt and it will taste relatively well seasoned to most people. At Earl M asks, does anyone want to know how the sausages are made? Well, that's an easy question. I want to know how the sausage is made. Um, I started a sausage restaurant in San Mateo, so I have a good deal of knowledge about how sausage is made. So yes, sausages have this reputation of being sort of lower quality meat. They're made out of scraps. I think that's good. It's a way to use up all the different parts of the animals. They are just meat, fat, seasonings, importantly salt, uh, and then they are stuffed into casings. So in a sausage, there are a few elements. So when you cut open a sausage, what you're going to see is a few things. First, there's going to be the meat. Sausages are often made from pork shoulder. The lean meat, that's gonna be the sort of darker colored parts. You're going to see the fat, which are these sort of creamier white parts. Um, you might see little specks in there, and those are gonna be the sort of spices that you're adding to flavor it. Finally, the most important element that you won't see with your eye is the salt. You cannot make a sausage without salt. What happens is when you mix ground meat with salt and you start kneading it, um, the salt will dissolve some of the muscle proteins um, and it allows them to stick together and it forms this protein matrix. So salt and meat is what gives a sausage structure. The casings are typically uh, made out of pig intestines. If you get a big, great big salami, that's probably a cow intestine. And if you're getting a natural casing hot dog, that is a lamb intestine. Yes, nothing to be afraid of. Great way to use up all the different parts of the animal um, and delicious. At Baby Chumps says, why do eggs make normal food taste better? Burgers, ramen, more eggs. Put an egg on that, ho, <laughs> and call it a meal. If you think about it, an egg is a thing that contains all the nutrients a growing embryo needs. So it's extremely nutrient dense and our bodies are hardwired to like foods that are nutrient dense. That's why eggs taste so delicious. It's as simple as that. So we taste it and we think, yum, this is good. At The Scramble asks, question for you, how often do you sharpen your knives and how do you do it? I sharpen my knives probably once every six months or so. I like to use water stones. This one is a thousand and six thousand. The lower the number, the grittier it is. So I typically start with 800 to a thousand or so and then go up to around 6,000. So from the cutting edge to the back and divide that by three. And what you wanna do is maintain that angle the entire time you're sharpening. I go in one direction for about 20 strokes or so. And by that point, the metal gets pushed up and it curls over the edge of the knife. I should feel a burr on that side. Then you can flip the knife over and start working on the other side. And so I'll start with 20 on each side until I feel the burr on both sides. Then I'll go down to 10 on each side. Then I'll go down to something like four, then two, and then I'll do a bunch of single strokes. And once that's all done, I'll move over to a higher grit stone. So that's the basic process of sharpening a knife. At 
Dennis N. Derry2 underscore asks, what is myoglobin? What is the function of myoglobin? Myoglobin is a pigment that makes our muscles red. So when you look at a steak and you say, oh, it's still bloody, that's actually not blood that you're seeing giving it the color. It's myoglobin, which is muscle pigment. Now, with some modern meat manufacturers, what they sometimes do is that if you buy vacuum sealed meat in those pouches, it'll look very bright red. And what they've done is they've injected that pouch with carbon monoxide. And when carbon monoxide reacts with with myoglobin, it turns into carboxymyoglobin. There's this myth going around that the food industry is dyeing meat red to make it look more appealing to customers. They're not literally dyeing it red, they're just kind of maintaining that red color in what may be a sneaky, underhanded manner, but it's not going to affect the quality of the meat. Alain Gruder says, anyone recommend me a good cooking wok? What I would recommend for a home cook is a flat bottom wok. There's a bunch of materials you can choose from. Carbon steel is the best for a wok because it's inexpensive, it's indestructible. Uh, you can raise it to a really high temperature. So here's another wok we have here. Um, so this, is a nonstick wok. So nonstick would be the material I would be least likely to recommend because nonstick cannot be heated to the temperatures required for certain types of stir fries. Uh, what happens is if you heat up nonstick, the coating will start to vaporize and uh, it's really unhealthy to breathe in. So nonstick woks, I would stay away from them. At Kayila says, why is angel hair pasta so damn sticky? For something angelic, it sure is a pain in the ass. Angel hair in particular is going to be very sticky because for a given volume of pasta, because it's so skinny, you're going to have a very high amount of surface area. So the more surface area you have, the more starch is gonna come out, the more surfaces there are to stick to each other. In order to keep pasta from sticking, you do wanna get, get it into a sufficient volume of water that you can get it moving right from the start. So the, the main time when pasta is gonna to stick together is right at the beginning as it's starting to cook. So you wanna make sure that your pasta is moving right at the beginning. Um, once it starts moving and boiling and setting and softening, you're not gonna, it's not really gonna stick as much. At Chow Oyimbo Nyash asks, can someone please help me? How do you make fried rice? I could explain it, but I will just show you instead. You don't need any specific type of rice. The most important part is that it is dry. Take a little bit of cornstarch sprinkle it over, and that's gonna help you break up the individual grains of rice. I recommend a wok. So you wanna preheat it over really high heat. You want everything to go really hot and fast. So I've got a couple eggs, scrambled them with just a little pinch of salt, and get them right in there. Gonna cook them just until they're set. And then out they go into a bowl we have waiting on the side. All right, so now I'm gonna reheat my wok and start working on my rice. And the goal here is to really try and sort of separate the, the grains without turning them into one big pile of mush. So you can see I'm using the back of the spatula here to kind of push them against the wok and keep them moving all the time over the highest heat possible. Instead of cooking all the rice at once, if you have a really weak burner, cook it in two different batches and then we'll add everything back in at the end. Wok smoking hot, a little bit more oil in the center. Onions are gonna go in, carrots are gonna go in, some of these frozen peas are gonna go in. I'm gonna add some garlic a little pinch of scallions. Now finally, everything is gonna go back in, so the rice and the eggs. And now what we'll do is we'll use our spatula to break those eggs up so that we get a nice even distribution. Soy sauce around the edge and sesame oil. It's important to add your sauces around the edge when you're cooking in a wok like this because what happens is if you add them directly to the center, they kind of trickle down through the food so they don't really sear. Whereas if you add them around the edge, you can see they give that nice sizzle right when you add them. And what that does is it reduces the soy sauce rapidly and kind of introduces new flavors. Gives it a little bit of the smoky flavor. That's basically it. Shall we try it? Delicious. So the big takeaways are make sure that your rice is dry before you start cooking with it. Cook hot, cook in batches, and cook fast. And that's basically it. Lunatic Destiny asks, why would you use baking soda while cooking? Baking soda is a powdered alkaline. When you take baking soda like this and you add vinegar to it, it's going to form carbon dioxide and water. That's what gives your cakes and your pancakes and cookies lift. All right, it's a chemical leavener. So you can take baking soda, put it in water and boil Western style uh, pasta and it will give it a sort of springiness and a flavor very similar to Eastern style things like ramen. You can take baking soda, boil your potatoes. And what happens is the, uh, the higher pH makes it so that the pectin on the surface of the potato, that's sort of the carbohydrate glue that holds the potato cells together, the pectin breaks down faster. And so you end up with potatoes that are softer on the exterior so that when you subsequently toss them and roast them, they get a lot more surface area, they make them extra crispy. And finally, you can add baking soda to your beans if you're planning on making a bean soup or you want them to tender 
pulverized faster. So I add baking soda to the water when I'm making something like hummus and I'm cooking the chickpeas because it'll cook the chickpeas much, much faster. At Ren Harker asks, what is so difficult about cooking pork to a safe temperature? Maybe your parents' generation or your grandparents' generation, there was this time when pork was relatively unsafe to eat at raw or rare temperatures um, because of the risk of a parasitic infection called trichinosis. That has been almost completely elim eliminated in modern pork, so it's not really something you have to worry about. So a lot of modern pork has very, very lean meat, and therefore it becomes harder to cook and keep juicy because lean meat dries out a lot faster without the uh, fat and the connective tissue to keep Keep it moist. So with pork, what I generally recommend, the best way to cook it to a safe temperature and make it stay juicy is to brine it. So if you have a pork chop, you put it in a, in a solution of about 2% salt, 2 to 3% salt in water, or you can just sprinkle it with salt and let it sit in your fridge overnight. And then when you cook it the next day, what happens is that salt breaks down the muscle proteins so that as they cook, they don't actually constrict as much, they don't squeeze out as much moisture. As far as safe cooking temperatures for pork versus beef versus chicken, the government will recommend that you take them all to 165 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the temperature at which uh, you get a seven log reduction in bacteria. That is only one out of every 10 million bacteria will survive. With most meats, I actually recommend cooking to a, a lower temperature. Things like steak are tastier at around 130 degrees, I think, just when the fat starts to render out. And things like pork and chicken, I generally cook to about 145 or 150 degrees. But essentially at 165 degrees, it takes less than a second for that to occur. Whereas at about 150 degrees, it takes a matter of minutes. So as long as you're taking your temperature carefully and you're coming up to a specific temperature and letting it rest at that temperature before serving it, you can get the same sort of safety level even at lower temperatures. At Rianati asks, why is it so difficult to make perfect rice? It's either too soggy, sticky, or too hard. Help me. Depending on the type of rice you're using, you're gonna need a different water to rice ratio. With something like a Japanese sushi style rice, which is what I cook most, it's about 1.1 times water to one part of rice. I'll measure out my rice, put it in the pot, then I'll measure out 1.1 times that volume of rice, put it into the pot, start it cold, put a flame underneath it, bring it up to a simmer, put the lid on it, turn the heat down to the lowest possible setting and let it simmer at that temperature for about 10 minutes. Don't open it up, don't look at it. Definitely, definitely do not stir it. If you start stirring it, what happens is you release all this excess starch and that's why your rice starts to break and turn mushy. After 10 minutes, shut the flame off and let it sit for another 10 to 15 minutes to completely absorb all that liquid. And then finally, if you were patient and you didn't touch anything, when you open it up, you should have perfect rice. So those are all the questions for today. Um, thank you so much. I love it when people ask questions like this because it means you're thinking and you're using your brain while you're cooking and you're not just following the recipe, you're trying to get out there and experiment. And I love that. Thanks for watching Cooking Support.